Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our five minute histories videos. And today is Wednesday, June 3rd. And uh, this week in Baltimore and around the country, there are protesters who are reminding us how far we still have to go to achieve equality and civil rights. And today we thought we would honor a Baltimorean who beginning almost a hundred years ago um, was involved in that same fight and in many ways laid the groundwork for the peaceful protest actions that are taking place today. Um, and that. Uh, Baltimorean was Juanita Mitchell. Uh, Juanita Mitchell was born in 1913 uh, in Arkansas. She was the daughter of Lily Carroll Jackson. Uh, uh, Lily Carroll Jackson, we did a video on her. She was a civil rights uh, pioneer in her own right. Um, so uh, Juanita was her daughter, uh, as well as the daughter of Kiefer Jackson. Um, and Kiefer was an evangelist who used movies. He traveled around the country using movies to promote his message back in the 1920s and the 1930s. At a young age, they moved to uh, Baltimore and uh, Juanita, for, for you Baltimoreans who always want to know where everybody went to high school, she graduated from Douglas High School. Um, she also incidentally went on to graduate from the University of Pennsylvania, summa cum laude, uh, as well as she was the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Maryland Law School and went on to become the first African-American woman to practice law in Maryland. So uh, an unbelievable career in its own right. Uh, but even before she, before we get there, before she got to practicing law, um, as a youth at, at age 18 in 1931, so get that date, 1931, not 1950s or 60s, she, along with her mother, um, starts a movement called the Citywide Young People's Forum. And they do a lot of things. Um, one of them is uh, that they recognize that in Baltimore's African-American communities, a number of stores are owned by uh, white owners who will gladly take uh, the money of African-American patrons, but won't uh, uh, employ them, won't let them earn their own money that way. And so the Young People's Forum uh, essentially uh, mounts pickets and boycotts saying, uh, buy where you can work. So if they won't employ African-Americans, don't shop there. Um, this is one of the first instances, maybe the first instance on a big scale, uh, that youth were involved in the civil rights movement. So this idea, if you think of the 1960 Greensboro, um, Woolworths protest and those uh, young college kids with their elbows up on the lunch counter, um, that was possible and that insight into, into the impact that youth can have, that was coming out of Baltimore and in large part thanks to Juanita Mitchell um, as well as her mother. Um, Juanita goes on to college, and after college, she works for the NAACP as the director of youth programs. So she's now got a national platform, um, not just in Baltimore. Uh, she works for the, the famous uh, civil rights pioneer, um, uh, Walter White, um, and goes on. One of the things she does, in addition to helping organize youth around the country, um, she starts programs uh, to try to help African-American youth get into and attend, being able, being able to attend college. So um, again, this is the 1930s she's doing this. Um, uh, want to talk about the Mitchell Law Office. So a little bit later, she's now graduated from the University of Maryland Law School. She's practicing law, um, the law office at 1239 Druid Hill Avenue. That's her law office. She owns it at first with her mother, so jointly owned. And I want to talk about one instance, and that's the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. After that decision comes out at the Supreme Court, um, Juanita goes into action and mounts a campaign um, that a eventually leads to Maryland becoming the first state in the South to integrate its schools fully. And she mounts that campaign from the law office on the corner. And the building uh, is boarded up today, um, but it does have a, a roof on it and it's stable. Not uh, uh, maybe in its best shape ever, but really important as a, a civil rights um, uh, location. And it's not surprising that that building becomes a hub for the 1954 uh, response to Brown versus Board. Um, her husband, Clarence Mitchell, um, also becomes a co-owner of the building. And Clarence, uh, those of us uh, who have read a little bit about the Mitchell family know that he was the NAACP's chief lobbyist in Washington, um, called the 101st Senator for his ever presence in the Senate, lobbying for things like the 1964 Civil Rights Act um, that made it a federal crime to discriminate based on race or ethnicity or sex, and, and as well as the 1965 Voting Rights Act that abolished the practices um, like poll taxes and literacy tests that had made it all but impossible for many African-Americans to vote. 
from. So he's a co-owner of the building. Um, and, it, and also, uh, it's not a surprise that that building was the hub of activity in response to Brown versus Board, uh, because their friend and neighbor, Thurgood Marshall, who grew up uh, in that same community, um, was, of course, the NAACP's chief lawyer at the time, um, who argued successfully at the US Supreme Court. And, uh, and in fact, that building, the Mitchell Law Office building, was used as a moot court by Thurgood and Clarence and others as they practiced for the Supreme Court oral arguments. Um, I want to close with this one thought, uh, and that is that uh, as we look out today at the Mitchell Law Office and, uh, and see that it's in rough shape, but uh, still the Mitchell family in Baltimore City are working uh, to find a good use for it, um, I want to leave with the thought of the NAACP's lasting remembrance to Juanita Mitchell. Um, and each year, the NAACP gives an award to one of its local chapters uh, for excellence in organizing and in using the court system to advance civil rights. And of course, that award is uh, called the Juanita Jackson Mitchell Award. And with that, we'll say thanks for joining us and we'll see you on Friday.